All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is lecture two, PHP continued. So it's tonight that we lay the foundation to launch into project two, uh, nope, project one, zero index, uh, starting next week. And the focus of that project, recall, will be to implement your, your own dynamic website for ordering pizzas and subs and salads. What we're going to do is hand you a PDF of a menu from an actual, though now defunct, uh, favorite pizza place of ours called Three Aces, for those of you who worked at Harvard and might know it for some time. The last thing we have of this wonderful place is their menu. Uh, so we'll provide that to you. And what you'll find um, as is often the case, unfortunately, in life, um, a not a lot of logic was put into the design of this particular menu because this is not necessarily a technical operation. They have a menu. They want humans to be able to interact with this menu on a printed piece of paper or on the overhead, and they want to order food. And they don't need to worry so much about inconsistencies in their data and how they might represent this data so that a computer can actually understand it and add things correctly into a shopping cart. And so one of the design opportunities with this project is going to be to wrap your mind around this fairly simple, fairly small, but nonetheless mm, imperfect data set and figure out how to model it. And the database with which you're going to model this is not yet MySQL, not yet a proper database engine per se, but rather with uh, ASCII text files, specifically with XML files. So our focus tonight is to finish laying the foundation with some PHP syntax and features. Next week, we'll transition to the world of XML and XPath and things related there too. And at that point, you'll have enough to dive into project one, which will be posted to the course website then. Uh, and then you will be on your way. So realize we start fairly low key, so we can introduce a lot of fun material, sort of level the playing field. And it's a next week when you'll really get to dive in. We will have our uh, second section this evening. It will be led by uh, a gentleman by the name of of Keto Uchiyama, who's actually a former teaching fellow of the course, but same time, same place, right after class, 103. Uh, and he will uh, fill in any holes that I myself might uh, accidentally leave here, and also field questions and offer more examples. So with that said, we uh, spent some time on forms the other day. And there, these things are not all that interesting at first glance, right? Click this, uh, select that. I mean, we've used these kinds of basic input devices on most any website today. But honestly, they are the basic building blocks of any project one ends up doing. Now, granted, later in the semester, we'll deploy some more sophisticated tricks using JavaScript and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the web has gotten interesting. And web sites have gotten more complicated, even despite the fairly simple UI mechanisms that browsers today still provide us. And those are select menus and text inputs, text areas, radio buttons. I mean, even if you don't know that those are the labels we slap on them, they're the same things you've seen on most any website out there. Now, they've gotten a little prettier over time. There's this thing called CSS, cascading style sheets, with which people have made them look a little fancier. But at the end of the day, you click hit Enter or click Submit, and the same kinds of data are going from point A to B and back via the get strings or via post operations. So we'll look at that today a bit more and sniff some of our own traffic again as the opportunity arises. So this is a little screenshot from the course's own website. And what we wanted to do was just kind of demonstrate how one can make fairly easily, but with a little bit of investigative work, this kind of mechanism. So we just wanted, um, and to this day, we, it's still not clear to me if any student has ever used this particular interface we prepared for you. Oh, yes, one? OK, thank, thank you. <laughs> one, it is now justified. But what's interesting is, to be honest, I think to ask the question, how would you implement this? And frankly, how did we implement it? And honestly, it was just by kind of looking underneath the hood to figure out how these various websites work? Did they use post? Did they use get? So then we can mimic the behavior their own websites use to submit searches to themselves. So very similar in spirit to what we did last week with Google. So case in point last week with Google, turns out Google's search engine does not support what operation? So post, right? So you know it's sort of, OK, a nice dead end to reach, but sort of important if you're actually coding against that and need to make queries of their website. And we'll see again later in the semester that even though right now we're sort of keeping things on a high level with user interacting with browser and browser in turn act interacting with server, once, especially come final project time, there's a lot of fun opportunities out there with various APIs, application programming interfaces, via which you can, via HTTP, get back really interesting data data in what we'll see is XML format or JSON format, and then integrate that into your own website. So these very basic building blocks that for now we're just using to sort of reinvent wheels that other people, Google, have really implemented well already, are really just going to enable us to do more powerful things later. So with that said, this little search box on CS75.net 
if you've never noticed it, is down here. And it's just meant to be a sort of quick and dirty place to go if you want to search any one of these manuals, which thus far, granted, probably not that useful because you probably not have many opportunities yet to play with Apache or certainly haven't needed MySQL's manual. But let's see, if I go ahead and search for something like,、um, I want to figure out how to count the elements in an array with PHP. So I've just zoomed in here. I've typed count. I'm going to go ahead and click PHP. And ideally, yep, I've been whisked away to PHP search engine. So this was the first such,、uh, this is the first such feature we wanted to implement. And as we'll see, turns out the default behavior of these four buttons, if I hit enter on my keyboard alone, is to also go to that particular website. So there's four little puzzles to solve. How do we go about biting off this first one? Well, let's take a look.、Um, let's ignore the fact that that thing exists in the first place. Let me just go to php.net itself, and here's their website. So I noticed on php.net a couple semesters ago, they've got this little search box up top. And I wanted to embed that search box into my own website. And I didn't want to search their website myself. I didn't want to write a screen scraper, grab all their data, and then figure out what the best results are. I just want to punt on that detail, just like we did last week with Google. So I needed to figure out how that search box worked. All right, so I know offhand that、uh, there's a function out there called count. I wanted to just see what happens when I go ahead and type in. Count. I select the function list because, as you'll probably find in this course, even though there's a bunch of things you can search, odds are you'll care most about the function list. I'm going to go ahead and click this little icon here after zooming back out. And now, watch, for instance, the URL. Hopefully, in fact, it did change, but it sort of changed too effectively. Like I got whisked away immediately to the right answer. So that's not so good. So, and why is that not so good? Because I don't know, for instance, what URL I should have sent the user to. Ideally, I need kind of a page of search results like I clearly got. So maybe there's another approach here. So let me go back to the main menu.、Uh, let me see where、uh, I might have a more flexible opportunity. Let's go ahead and do not just function list, let's go ahead and say all、uh, online documentation. And let's see what happens here. Count, click enter there. Come on. OK. Interesting. So, more results than I care about, but this is at least a destination I can send the user to. So, the problem a moment ago was I don't know a priori what URL I should send the user to for the count function. I kind of would just prefer to hand to the students in the class you know, a list of top results and let php.net figure out you know, which is the best hit, the one at the top. So, how did I get here? Well, now we have a more dynamically generated, uh, uh, more dynamically producible. String. So notice the URL here. OK, so I click Submit. And now apparently I get redirected via what HTTP method? Easy question. OK, so get. And I know that only because the URL is changing. And moreover, it seems to be parameterized. Because remember, the convention is after the question mark comes attribute equals value, ampersand. Attribute equals value, ampersand. Attribute, and actually that's the wrong terminology. Parameter equals value, parameter equals value, dot, dot, dot. All right, so what do I need to pass in there? So L probably means English, so I'm just going to assume that I can hard code that for at least our crowd. P equals manual. I don't really know what P means, but presumably that means the user's manual, so I'll hard code that. So the magic is apparently in the parameter called Q. It's just a convention. Google calls it the same thing, but it's nice and compact, so that's the world, what the world generally does. So somehow I need to be able to generate. This URL. All right, so let's take a look. Let me go over to my own PHP code, or rather to my own HTML code on cs75.net. I'm going to go ahead and I can take two approaches here. So, again,、uh, I'll try to drop little tricks that save time and are interesting over time. If I choose view page source, I see this kind of mess. A lot of it's dynamically generated, so it's not quite pretty printed. So, you know what? What turns out to be often more useful is if you click on a portion of the page,、uh, right click or control click, and then choose inspect element. And in Firefox, if you've installed the Firefox,、um, Uh, Firebug plugin, you'll get this interface. Safari and WebKit actually come, they, one knocked off the other's terminology. In Safari, you also have an inspect element、uh, link. It gives you a very similar interface. I'll say I have a bias for Firefox because it's the first one I learned. I know it.、Um, Seems Safari does the same thing. So just realize these tools exist. But I like it just because it parses the HTML a lot more neatly than we generated it. So I can see what's going on a bit more interestingly. So let's see. Let me go back up to my split window here. I'm going to scroll back down. 
And just for clarity's sake, oh, there we go. So I highlighted search a manual. If I scroll down here, it looks like this is the div that's containing that. So, again, just in terms of functionality, will we see Firebug is useful? Even aesthetics, honestly, if you're trying to lay out a website and go that final mile with CSS, the fact that you can highlight exactly what the div is on the page has been hugely useful for what it's worth over time for me. But here it is. Here's the form. So, I'm going to expand this form by clicking that. Looks like inside this form is a few different structural elements, but notice here I have method equals get. Action equals, oh, so that's kind of interesting. It looks like I just went to this URL, realized the base of that URL is http colon dot 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 results dot php question mark and then something. So somehow I just need to submit the something to that search engine. So how can I do that? Well, let me go back to my own source code, albeit in Firebug's view here, and notice that I've done a couple of things. So one, I hard coded as the action. Whoops, I hard coded as the action, precisely that URL, devoid of the per,、uh, question mark, devoid of the parameters. Inside of this layout now, I have this. So input type equals text,、uh, then I have some CSS stylization, then name equals Q. All right, so I've simply, and let me zoom in on that. So there's a lot of.、Um, Aesthetic distractions here, but the juicy part is that the name of this parameter is Q. All right, so what's beneath it? Let's just get a sense of whether or not there's some other magic going on here.、Uh, looks like, oh, looks like here's the first of my buttons. So let's actually ignore that for just a moment and scroll down instead to this guy here. Aha, interesting. Here's another button, but this one is specifically labeled value equals quote unquote PHP. So the value of a button in HTML is, whoops. Is whatever is actually on the face of the button itself. And what else do we have here? Class, that's CSS. Type equals submit. Value equals PHP. And then apparently some JavaScript. So in a moment, we'll peel back one other layer and see how I'm using the same form to get four different behaviors using JavaScript, not using some native HTML feature. But for now, the takeaway is that. Replicating、uh, PHP.NET search engine is really as simple as we did last week by knocking off the right action line and the right queue. And it seems I've actually cut some corners here. What have I seemingly omitted altogether in hopes that it will just work anyway? Yeah, so language L equals whatever and then P equals whatever. Well, let's see. Let's do one more test here. So I'm going to close Firebug. I'm going to go ahead and search for count. I'm going to go ahead and click PHP and watch the URL up top. Here we go. Up here, a little spinning globe. All right, so it seems that I submitted actually kind of the wrong parameter. Fortunately, PHP.NET is ignoring it. What parameter did I apparently submit, sort of unintentionally? Yeah, so PHP. So apparently, that's the name I gave, though, to the button. Called PHP seems to have no effect. Maybe bad stuff would happen if PHP.NET were actually expecting that parameter, but here, seemingly no downside. Yeah. Interesting. So, can we、uh, insert our own parameter value pairs into the text field so that they get passed to that URL string? Well, let's try. So, here's count.、Um, and let's see, something like what? Ampersand L equals、uh, ES for Spain? Probably. All right. So, just to be clear, because the font is small, that's what I've typed count space ampersand L equals ES. Just on a hunch, maybe this will give me Spanish. Let's go ahead and click PHP. And now notice the URL. So, short answer is no, but more interesting question is why? It actually looks like a lot of nonsense all of a sudden. Why? Yeah. Exactly. So, this would actually be a bad thing if you could pass raw parameters just by accidentally or intentionally typing in the conventions that the browser relies on. So, what browsers do by default here, and we're seeing it explicitly, is when the user hits submit or clicks enter, what the browser does is it calls、uh, a function that in PHP we'll see is called、uh, URL encode. So, there's various ways of encoding. Uh, strings. One of them is according to conventions that are supposed to be followed for URLs. And what that means generally is that any dangerous character or character that has special meaning, like ampersand, is escaped. And so what we're seeing here is the result of that. So plus is generally a stand in for what character? 
so for space. So you might also see it as percent twenty because you can essentially embed in a URL the numeric code that represents a character by doing percent and then that numeric code. But plus is also shorthand notation for that, presumably because it's just so common. But percent twenty or plus denotes our space that I typed after the word count. So percent two x、uh, two six. What is this probably or presumably? And so that must be the ampersand because what comes next is a raw l followed by percent three d. Looks like these are in hex actually, hexadecimal. So what's percent three delta? So that's the equal sign. That too has special meaning. So the browser encodes it so as not to have confusion. Es is not a special string, so it just spits it out raw. But then here's a real ampersand followed by a real parameter followed by a real equal sign and a real value. So that's actually a good thing that the browser does that, and it's intended behavior. And in fact, one of the easy bugs that's possible for us, the developer, to introduce later in the semester is honestly failing to encode your own inputs, especially come JavaScript time,、um, because you'll end up breaking your URLs potentially. Another problem too, as we'll see, is this: if you have a form on a web page, and that form has like an input field, so maybe input type. Equals quote unquote text, and then you're allowed to have a value parameter, a value attribute that allows you to specify the default value for a text field. When might you want to have a default value for a text field, as opposed to letting the user type it in? Sorry. Okay, so you could have a little hint like Facebook does before you log in, or any site like that. It usually says name or email address. Then the moment you click it, voila, it goes away. Thanks to JavaScript. What else might you want to put as a default value? A current, sorry. Okay, so something like a current date, or maybe even more commonly, the response the user him or herself previously typed, but typed somewhat incorrectly. You might want to pre-populate a form for them, giving the values they previously typed, if erroneously. So in short, it's very common to want to put default values in this string. So in the future, what we'll see quite commonly is you might do something like this: open bracket question mark. Uh, echo or print, which are pretty much synonymous in PHP. I might want to say dollar sign、uh, name if I want to spit out in the context of PHP the user's name, which at that point in time just so happens to be stored in a variable called name. But here too is where escaping can get useful. Suppose that the user, him or herself, the last time they filled out that form, you know, did something stupid like David, quote unquote, J. Malin, what's going to happen if you and your PHP code just do this? Well, PHP, recall from last week, gets executed server side, so everything between this bracket and question mark and this guy here get transformed to the result. So if the result that the user, if the value the user previously typed that's currently stored in this variable is David quote unquote J Malin, what's going to happen in reality is the HTML or XHTML you send to the browser is going to be David, and I'll write it without curly quotes here, J Malin. "Quote unquote." That's kind of ambiguous. That's not well-formed XHTML. Now bad things are going to happen for some definite for some unknown definition of bad in this case. Now this might seem somewhat contrived, but what about a more reasonable example? So suppose that、uh, it's not David Malan typing his name in, but suppose just because this is my style and it's perfectly legit in XHTML, I just like to use single quotes. And suppose it's not David J Malan. But the last person to fill out this form was the Irish guy David O'Malley, right? This is even more reasonable. Bad. Whoops. David O. Quotation mark Malan. This too very bad. Okay, so very simple examples, but very common. So what's the solution? If if what's really here underneath the hood is an echo statement from PHP, and we'll see more of this kind of functionality today. If what's really here is this echo. Name. What should I really be doing in this chunk of PHP code? Just intuitively, even if you're not quite sure what the right syntax is yet. Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. So somehow call a function that handles the escaping of dangerous quote unquote characters for you. And realize we're talking about two different contexts here. Same problem, but slightly different contexts. URLs have their own constraint. Ampersand's bad, equal sign's bad, and a couple of other uh, syntactic details. In the context of XHTML, quotes are clearly also bad. Um, angled brackets are also bad. So there's different functions for different contexts in the one we're now talking about on the board. Turns out there is one called HTML special chars. PHP likes to be verbose, but as the documentation here says, this function, HTML special chars, converts special characters to HTML entities. The entity is the thing with the ampersand, uh, NBSP semicolon is an example of one of those. So if you call HTML special chars on the variable called name, then any dangerous characters like quotes will not be spit out as a single quote, which clearly is problematic, but instead as something like this, ampersand Q-U-O-T semicolon. So that fixes that problem. So this is, again, one of these very common mistakes. And after tonight's class, to be honest, next time you're using the web, I mean, keep an eye out for these sort of newbie mistakes. They happen very often. And later in the semester, we'll talk specifically about what security problems arrive from just stupid, simple mistakes like this. Um, it's very easy, for instance, to start messing with someone's database even just because that developer forgot to take care with a detail like this. So there's actually some real world motivation for caring about what seems to be just syntactic minutia because bad things happen if one is not sensitive to that. Okay, any questions on escaping URLs or where we began here, which was just hitting enter and submitting a form from us to someone else altogether? No? Okay, so let's scroll back then to our own website in cs75.net. We have, again, this little interface. And apparently, there's four other buttons. So there's actually a reason I resorted to JavaScript here. So if we have one form but four buttons, you can't really submit to four different action attributes. Because just intuitively, there's only one action attribute in a form. And as an aside, XHTML only supports one attribute with a given name. So it's not like you could have four different action lines. It's just not syntactically possible. So I needed to resort to some JavaScript. And one of the recurring themes we'll see in this course, and really dynamic website uh, design in general, is these trade-offs. There's definitely some people out there who have JavaScript disabled or whose mobile device does not support JavaScript. So realize that even though I'd say this is thankfully less of a concern these days, it's absolutely a judgment call. This feature will not work for some people on the internet. We're OK with that. Whether you are or your user base is, is another question altogether. So with that said, how did I implement, for instance, the MySQL button? Well, one of the functions we might play with with MySQL, uh, let's see, what might we look up in MySQL? So date underscore format. I can't just hit Enter, because the default behavior, as we've seen, is to go to php.net. So I'm going to explicitly click MySQL. Date format, OK, good. Looks like I got whisked away to a different website altogether. The URL, huh, another get string. So now things start to, start to get fun. Anytime, I mean, maybe this will just make you a little, um, I don't know, OCD, and now noticing what get strings you can now forge yourself. But sometimes it has value. So here's search.mysql slash search question mark. Another Q. Q un equals date underscore format. Looks like they went with LR equals lang underscore en. But you know what? I like to be a little curious, a little anal, omit as many things as I can. Looks like it still works with a slight change, but so be it. I still got the number one hit up here, which is something about date and time. So how did I implement this? Well, this is actually more of a, a sneak preview of what we'll be doing in a couple of weeks' time. But let me go ahead and open up. Uh, Firebug. It's not strictly necessary, but again, I just like how it pretty prints everything for me. So let's see. Here I am in my code, div with just search a manual. So let me go into the form itself. It's the same form. In the first div was just my text area for Q. So let's see what these buttons are doing. It's a little sloppy, but let's see if we can wrap our mind around it nonetheless. So here's the input for that button labeled MySQL. Input and hmm. Can I go any bigger here? Let's see. So input, class equals button. So ignore that. It's just some CSS. Type equals button. That is what gives it its button appearance. So that's an XHTML thing. Value, what does this do again? A little sanity check. Just the aesthetic label. But it's actually more than that, because if I give this button a name, if I give this input a name, notice that it also gets submitted to 
the server. That's how we have the ampersand PHP equals capital PHP. So as an aside, if there are ever UI mechanisms, buttons, select menus that you don't want submitted, maybe because you're using some fancy JavaScript to control them instead, just don't give them names. And presumably the browser should not transmit them to the server, which might just be a good thing. All right, so on click. So this is kind of a little magic that we'll see later in the semester. We can implement a little more cleanly. It doesn't need to be in this long line of code that just looks like a mess on the screen. We'll be able to write JavaScript more cleanly than this. But this was really just a quick and dirty little application. So let's see what it does. On click, do the following. Window.lo, where are we going with this? Yep, window. Dot, there we go. Uh, Window.location equals, quote unquote, HTTP dev.mysql.com. Turns out that they've changed their URL schemes, but they still support the old version. It's not uh, the new one is apparently search, but seems to still work. Dev.mysql.com. Now it's wrapping just because it's long. Slash doc slash mysql slash search.php. Seems they've really cleaned up their URL since I wrote this. Um, question mark version equals 5.0. Ampersand Q equals. And there's the dynamism. So how do I insert what the user has typed in dynamically? Well, a little teaser. Apparently, whatever the user typed is stored in this last variable, document.search.q.value. So it's kind of a mouthful. But the sneak preview here is that in a JavaScript context, you can always refer to the whole page as document. Sort of that's a global variable of, uh, of sorts. Dot .search, where did that come from, do you think? Search, oh, I heard form. So the form itself had a name, which I chose just to be useful for myself. And it's a little, again, there's a lot of CSS mess here. But notice this line here. Notice that I gave my form a name. So document.name allows me to access the form called search. Could have called it foobar baz, but I called it search for clarity. So document.search. What's next? Q. Q is the name of the input. And then here too, it'll be a common mistake. Dot value actually gives you the string inside that box. Q just gives you the box, or really the chunk of memory, the object in memory representing that box. So dot value gives us the actual string. So what did we do in short? Document dot location equals HTTP, quote unquote, HTTP some stuff, Q equals, and then we concatenated that string and take a guess. What does window dot location represent? Exactly, the URL and the string. So the mere change I'm making to that global variable, if you will, window.location has the result of whisking the user off to that particular URL. So we won't spend time, I think, on the other buttons because really they're now just following a pattern. I figured out the get string. I figured out the parameter that I need to insert dynamically. And now using JavaScript that I implement the other three buttons. And so the net effect is that we have this little search engine that's making use of the hard work other people did. But allows us to have sort of a meta search engine. Right? You may recall there was a time years ago where everyone was trying to one up each other. There was Dogpile, which was this meta search engine. Apparently the best way to make a search engine was to search other people's search engines. And that's kind of what we've done here. Right? I promise we'll start creating our own intellectual property before long. But any questions about the basics? Yeah. Yes, a really good point, actually. And in fact, you know, let, let's do that because this is actually a really good, simple example of how we can implement our own server side processing. So that's actually a good trade off. If you can't do it in JavaScript or choose not to for compatibility reasons, absolutely, let's do it server side. And we'll write this much code to make this happen. So, what are the URLs that I need? Well, let me go ahead and steal a few of them. So, this is, oh, let me type something useful in here. So, foo. Let me click Apache. All right, looks like Apache themselves are knocking off Google's own search engine using domain search. But let me do this. I'm going to get a little cheat sheet here. So that's a sample URL for the Apache. I'm just pasting it into TextPad. Uh, let me quickly get search for foo on mysql.com. Paste that in there. Uh, let me go back now and get foo on php.net. Really, I'm just making a little cheat sheet for myself here so we can replicate this quickly. And now, whoops, too far. Now YUI, 
Okay, copy this. They're knocking off Yahoo, but perhaps no surprise since they made it. Okay, so essentially I need to write a PHP program that lives server side, that receives the user's input in a form, and then checks which button did they click, and based on that button, redirect the user to the appropriate search engine, thereby obviating the need entirely for any JavaScript. Because I'm just sending the data to the server, where because I control the server, I have much more control over the user's destination. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Let me go back to terminal. Uh, let me go ahead and call this search. Let's say, let's say search. Let me make a copy of something just to get us started here. Uh, copy source, copy this to, we'll call it search.html just to make clear which part is static and which part is dynamic. I'm going to go to cs75.net, good, lectures to source. OK, and now I'm going to butcher my own code. And I copy it only because remembering all the doc type stuff has always escaped me. So search, and I'm going to get rid of the body that we'll see in a subsequent example. All right, and I'm going to chmod it. So for those less familiar with Linux, 644 is world readable, essentially, for this case here. So I'm going to chmod my file. I'm going to go ahead and load it here. And voila, here's our canvas. So let's just whip up a quick form. So I'm going to go ahead and back to my XHTML. And I need a form here. So form action equals, where are we going to submit this to? Sorry? A PHP program. All right, give me a name. Audience participation. Search. Excellent choice. OK. How about method? Now you're on the hook. Now you're going to have to answer all the questions, apparently, because no one else is. OK. So let's go with get if only because we can see what's going on more clearly. But really, I'm kind of indifferent on this point here, because we're not submitting that much data. All right. So we need a few inputs. So input. Uh, name equals Q. Type is? Text, yep, yeah, OK. Do we need anything else? We can do size, max size, a bunch of stuff. Really not that interesting. This will get the job done. Uh, I'm going to put a line break just so I can somewhat mimic our design from earlier, though this is ultimately going to look ugly. So hopefully that's OK if I disclaim it in advance. Input type equals, what can I do here? OK, so let's say button, and then the value equals. All right, so let's start with PHP. And now I need to give this a name, probably. Yes? No? Sure. <laughs> OK, you're flexible. All right, so let's just call this site for now. Uh, let me start with two. Before I make my life too complicated, let me see if I do something like this. I'll alphabetize. So MySQL and PHP. So let's see where this gets us. Let me reload. As promised, it is quite underwhelming, but it's hopefully functional. So if I go ahead and type in foo here and then click PHP, let's see. Hmm, doesn't actually take us anywhere. What might the problem be? Well, if we actually wanted to submit the form, let's see what happens here. I'll change this. So I reloaded entirely. And when in doubt, incidentally, in this course and really website development in, in general, if something's weird, forcibly reload the page, which usually is holding command and then hitting reload or option, depends on your OS. Um, shift in some OSs, just clear your cache is really the last resort. Foo, let's go ahead and click PHP. OK, some good stuff happened, almost. Well, half good stuff. Let's see where I ended up. Search.php, question mark, foo equals, uh, sorry. Q equals foo, ampersand site equals PHP. And hopefully, let's go back one step. I'm going to type in foo, but this time click MySQL. Whew, worked. So now the variable called site has changed. So that's what's neat about the submit button. It will uh, deterministically submit one value or the other depending on which one you actually click. All right, so that's good because now I have the ability to check a condition in PHP. We didn't do much with PHP last week, but no surprise, perhaps. They have if, ifs and elses and else ifs. So let's actually set up a little framework here. Uh, Search.php. I'm going to open my file with open bracket question mark, close bracket question mark. Um, as an aside, when might you do this versus what I just did a second ago? 
Yeah, that's sort of my rule of thumb.、Um, at least if I'm writing code that only I care about, I control the server, I can enable what are called short tags. Frankly, I prefer writing this. But if I ever need to write code that other people might need to interface with, I'm writing an open source library that I want people to adopt, you're going to annoy a lot of users if you require them to somehow enable features on their server that are really not strictly necessary. So for the course purposes, this is fine. Looks a little cleaner to me. So let's go with this. So we can do a few things here. So one, Let me go ahead and completely punt and just say header, send an HTTP header, one called location, and take the user to,、uh, sure, let's do it again, DisneyWorld.com. All right, close, let me zoom out. So, I've just issued an HTTP header, and per our discussion last week, that's one of the special headers that when a browser sees it, it should do what with that value? Yeah, it should whisk the user away to that URL. So let's see. I've unfortunately not accomplished much just yet, but let me go ahead and refill out this form. I'm going to type in foo. I'm going to go with PHP, and <laughs> we'll have a nice little distraction from last time. We, in fact, got redirected to Disney World, but why? That's the more interesting question. Well, let me open my live HTTP headers. All right, this is my little sniffing tool, and let me now click submit. I'm going to ignore the aesthetics of what just came back, but scroll up to the very top to see what just happened. And in fact, I just submitted to search.php, q equals foo, site equals php. That resulted in this get string and all of this stuff from last time. But more interesting now is the server's response. Apparently, and this is a PHP feature, if you use the header function in PHP, spit out a header that begins with location colon, PHP notices, oh, you're trying to redirect the user somewhere. I am going to return not code 200, which is all things are good, but rather 302 by default. This is moved temporarily,、um, thereby presuming that this is just a temporary thing. And go send the user to where? To this location field here. And what a browser should then do upon seeing the 302 followed by the location field is, as we just saw visually, whisk the user away to that site. So we now have the basic building blocks. We just need to add a bit of logic. So I don't only want to send the user to Disney World. I probably want to do something like this. If the, uh, uh, let's see, the parameter called site, how do I get at the variable called site? The parameter called site that was submitted. In PHP. Dollar sign, sorry?、Uh, so it's not dollar sign site. We have to be a little more specific than that. So we have to specify what method did this variable come in on, and it was、uh, get. So the convention to avoid confusing it with other variables that you might write is dollar sign underscore capital G E T. Uh, quote unquote, this is an associative array or hash table more generally, which means you can index into it not with 0, 1, 2, 3, but also actual strings. The string is called again site, good, close quotes. So if this, let's go with our typical syntax, equals equals, what do you want to do here? Yeah, so PHP, all caps in this case is important because that's how I hard coded the value in my HTML file. If it equals that, well, let me indent here. And let me go to, whoops, let me go to, whoops, I can keep location.、Uh, where do I want to go? Yeah, so here's where I need my cheat sheet, which is my PHP one. It's the third one that I copied onto my little notepad thing there. So let me paste this in. And now something's got to be dynamic here. So I have a couple of options. So I need to sub out FOO, obviously, for the value in what parameter? Q, which I defined again. Q is the, value, is the name of this box here. So we have a couple of approaches here. So let's first take the approach we saw in a JavaScript context.、Um, I really don't need to pass in this thing at the end. We determined that that was just junk, that I was unnecessarily sending them. So it feels like I need to send them to this URL, but concatenate onto it the value of Q. So dot is the concatenation operator in PHP. By contrast, it's plus in JavaScript, just FYI. But it's dot in PHP. So where is it? Dollar sign underscore get.、Uh, again, Q, good. Close parentheses, semicolon. So now I've simply dynamically created a string. I can zoom in 
for clarity, I've dynamically created a string, happens to be a URL followed by a question mark, q equals something. The something has been concatenated on based on the value of q. And the header function, as we've seen, already whisks the user away. So the next, version, the next step is pretty easy, right? Let's just copy paste that. Let me do else if. You'll find the syntax of PHP is very similar to Java, C, C++, C Sharp, and all of those. So now I want to change this not to be PHP, but so my SQL, capitalization again important. All right, I don't want this URL this time, so let me go to my cheat sheet. And I'm going to go to the MySQL one, which is this guy here, paste this in. Uh, I'm going to be a little lazy just so I can keep the same pattern. I'm going to ditch the English and hope it works for now. I'm going to ditch the foo because now I can just plug that in there. And now I've handled these two cases. And then finally, let's not bother with the other two just because they're not any more enlightening. If that just doesn't work, uh, where do I want to send the user? What's that? All right, so we can do header. <laughs> All right, I'm not clicking that one again, though. HTTP, www, disneyworld.com. OK, good. All right, and now as an aside, when you issue header function calls in PHP, if there were uh, some more code down here, the whole point of a header redirect is to actually send the redirect and whisk the user away. So usually you will see header calls with locations in them followed immediately by an exit because it's probably not intended behavior if you try to send the user somewhere and then you sort of arrogantly assume that you're still going to have time to generate output for the user that they will see. It's essentially one or the other. It's a small white lie, but for the most part, common mistake is to send a header and then try to do something more at the end of the file. But here it's not necessary because this little control file really doesn't do anything in life other than redirect the user to one of three places, either php.net, mysql.com, or Disney World in all other cases. All right, so let's take a look if this actually works. Save it. Correct. You only need the curly braces if you have two statements or more in, uh, as part of the condition. All right, so let's go back here. I don't need to reload, but I'll do it just to uh, start scr from scratch here. Let me go ahead and search for the count function on php.net. Click PHP. And in fact, I am sent now, voila. So what just happened? Well, that was kind of too fast for me to follow. So let me go to live HTTP headers. Let me go ahead and re-click PHP. Okay, I can see visually that I ended up where I need to be, but how did I get there? Well, let's scroll back in our history here. What just happened? Well, this URL was just induced. Uh, a visit to that URL was induced by my clicking the button. Okay, count site equals PHP. That issued this get request. All of this was automatically generated by the browser. So the interesting part, hopefully, is the response. Yep, there's a response we're expecting. There's a location that we ourselves generated. What happened next? Well, again, the dashed line means here comes the next request response. So the browser took it upon itself, as it should, a good modern browser, to next request the URL that came to it in the location field. And then all of this stuff was automatically generated. What comes back? Hopefully, a response from, yep, 200 from php.net. And then we see the actual search results that we care about. So again, the exercise here is not valuable because now you can implement a search engine on top of PHP.net. But really, implementing it boils down to these basic building blocks. That is just how the internet, or more specifically, how HTTP works. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Ah, good question. So let me go back. I've kind of littered my tabs here with this. Let me reload. And go ahead and type foo and hit enter. So now we apparently got submitted to uh, MySQL. And I actually don't recall if this is well defined. It might be the case in the spec that it's the first such uh, 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 input type of type submit that is the default. But I would have to check the spec or experiment to see if that's deterministic. So I kind of cut corners there since we did this on the fly. So when did you actually in this case, um, you, if you were getting input from the user, you wouldn't in this case, unless the URL were somehow induced another way. Um, but the alternative I'll offer uh, is that had we omitted this altogether, 
you could contrive a situation in which the user just reaches a blank page, a dead end, because if we're not spitting anything out, they're not going to see anything. Now, whether that's a bad thing is maybe not the case, because if they were wasting time to figure out how they can try to submit a form without this parameter, it doesn't really matter what they see, presumably. So not necessarily a downside. So let me introduce one other piece of syntax, just because it's an, a useful opportunity. If this is looking a little messy to you, know that PHP, just as an aside, supports switches. You don't just have to put primitives as the condition in a switch. You can actually put entire variables. So you can say something like this. You can switch on the value of that attribute. And then what you can do here is case, uh, quote unquote, PHP colon. Then you can, whoops, then, oh, damn it. All right, my keyboard went awry. You can say switch. You can say dollar sign underscore get site. And then you can say case, quote unquote, PHP, uh, quote, uh, rather colon. You can do this. You can then break as you do in most languages. And then you can say case, my SQL, close quote. Uh, there we go. And break. And finally, there you go. Sort of syntactic details that might not be terribly enlightening to spend much time on, but PHP has ifs, else ifs, else. It also has uh, switching constructs like this. Yeah? Uh, apart from like, the JavaScript is a client-side client execution, and uh, PHP is on the server side. So apart from that being different, what other things do we have to consider to decide whether I have to use PHP or JavaScript? Mm. So that's a sort of perfect classroom type question, actually. Um, so what considerations go into how you implement this, whether the JavaScript approach, the version one, or this PHP approach? It depends what your goals are, to be honest. So one upside of implementing the very first version with JavaScript is that you don't have to bother writing any of the PHP code. You don't have to have your server get hit with an HTTP request just to bounce the user elsewhere uh, for scalability purposes. Not in this site, but maybe in general, that might be a good thing. Um, a downside, though, is that you have no idea what users are using your little search box for because you have no way of logging their behavior if almost all of the traffic is going directly from their browser off to, thanks to JavaScript, those particular websites. So a negative, uh, it, it, a downside of the first version is that you have no eyes into what the user's behavior is. And frankly, thankfully, the gentleman raised his hand and claimed publicly that he uses the search engine because we by nature of the implementation, have no clue if any student ever until this semester has used that particular search box. So it really depends on what your goals are. Um, and in this case, uh, given the limited use that that kind of feature would have, it's probably a toss up, to be honest. Uh, we could track traffic to our site, not to their site. Right, but if you, if you direct them through the search.php. Yes, we could absolutely. Correct. If we implement it with version 2 with PHP, we see everything that's going through uh, the, that search box and we can log everything that's going on, even without Google Analytics. We can just log every request. So it depends. Now, as an aside, and this is even though we won't spend much time in this course talking about mobile development per se, which is better on a device like this, an iPhone, Blackberry, or whatever? Oh, good. We're hearing both, actually. OK, so I need someone, uh, someone who just said JavaScript. Why? OK, so it's faster because it's all client side. I have 600 megahertz in my pocket. Let's use it for something. I mean, as a fair claim. What about PHP, someone in that camp? Sorry? Okay, so server side computation is how that gets implemented. Why, though, is that a good thing? Like, why do you like that? Oh, interesting. Okay, so I have three gigahertz server side. So that's fair. But then again, if we have lots of users, I'd say, well, a million users, three gigahertz doesn't go as far as 600 megahertz per. But fair, it's certainly in the case of our site. Other thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So just compatibility. If, if the phone doesn't support JavaScript, kind of a shame that you could have implemented it in as few lines of code server side, chose not to. Now you've screwed over a few users or some subset of users. But there's another reason that I would actually vote against the PHP approach on a device like this, potentially. Yeah, latency. So the fact that using the second version of this requires that I submit a form. So I pull up the search box, submit a form to cs75.net. 
I get a response. I then, the browser, have to make yet another request because CS75.net told me to. So I've doubled the number of HTTP, or I've increased by 50%, uh, went to, uh, yeah, doubled the number of HTTP transactions I need to take. And if you've ever used any of these things, call it 3G or whatever you want, it's slow, certainly relative to just making one request. So that's two. Um, and if I'm hedging here, there is no one right answer. There kind of isn't. It really depends on your goals. Yeah? Absolutely. You would save bandwidth too, which for web course website, not such a big deal. Big public website or even a university website getting thousands of hits a day, millions of hits a day, like every little byte starts to add up. Absolutely. And you have to pay for that somehow. Security. Um, security, I'd put it on the user side because the less a user touches your server, I mean, the less likely it is to get exploited intentionally or unintentionally. But I'd say that's not a prevailing concern for this particular application. Good questions. Yeah? This is just a basic syntax question. Uh, maybe it's in the PHP tutorials and very mm -hmm. obvious. But usually, the things that I always have the hardest with is realizing in the error function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the first thing I would think is, you know, oh, I just should put the, the you know, HTTP. Now there, now is that kind of easily documented in the PHP tutorial, or is it just something? <laughs> This is one of those things you probably just know, to be honest. I so the question or concern for those playing along at home is. Um, why is there no function called location that just takes an argument, which is the URL, which would be more sensible than this? Or how do you know? Or you need to put the word location. How do you know? That so it's a good question. The short answer is you have to learn it somewhere, honestly, whether it's because someone told you, as we did today, whether it's because you read the manual closely, or really if you just read the documentation and realize that the header function, in this case, issues an HTTP header. HTTP headers by nature are keyword colon value. So knowing what an HTTP header means, it's, it, knowing what an HTTP header is can allow one to infer that a header function that spits out headers just must, by nature of HTTP, be formatted in this way. But I would concede that, um, or I would argue that this is unnecessarily sort of um, ambiguous. I think much more reasonable would be a function called header that takes two arguments, frankly. One is the thing before the colon. The second one is the thing after. Because right now, what PHP is clearly doing is parsing the headers you pass it, realizing, oh, it starts with L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. Let me now issue code 302. So there's just some messy stuff going on server side. So there's a little sloppiness, absolutely, in PHP. And I think this is one instance of it, sure. Yeah, I and mean, frankly, there's not many situations like this. And location is terribly useful. So as, da as bad an approach as it is to moving the user around, it's incredibly useful. It's incredibly common. And when you worry, can worry less about mobile devices, perfectly reasonable. And in fact, we've seen it in play because when I was submitting to the old school format of MySQL's uh, query uh, URL, they were clearly redirecting me because that's why I saw in my own browser a URL other than the one in my own code. Yeah. So that's a good question that you're always asking the questions I didn't anticipate uh, tonight. Um, I will figure that out magically during the break. I, I actually forget offhand, because I usually do it with rewrite rules and not in raw PHP. And we saw last week that you just put it in the square brackets in that context. But I'll check. Easy. Should answer. Yeah? Is there a way to have like, a mobile version that says if users are on mobile device, don't give them the search box, and then just don't? Oh, absolutely. And we'll see, and even you'll experience with Project One, even though it's not targeted at mobile devices, you can certainly spit out content dynamically. The question being, can you only optionally spit out the search box for some users and not others? Absolutely. Doing that well, though, is um, really opens a Pandora's box of questions like, how do you implement? It? You have interesting conversations about MVC, model view controller at that point. Do you have different templates or views for different devices? Short answer, you can do it with just an if else in code or a switch statement, but you can also do it a lot more cleanly um, with various uh, uh, programmatic approaches. Other questions? Yeah? You could implement it such that if JavaScript enabled it, use JavaScript and so absolutely, yes, you can have. Um, 
Correct. You can fail gracefully, excuse me, so to speak, whereby uh, you can code things in a way, if you're careful, such that if JavaScript is there, it works very well. Um, if it's not there, you've already, you've nonetheless hard coded a get a method attribute and an action attribute, so the data will go somewhere, at which point you can punt to the server. So absolutely. That's another common approach. And one of the reasons, incidentally, that we introduced in the very beginning of the course, YUI for both CSS and eventually some JavaScript, is that those folks in particular um, have, uh, have done an amazing job of vetting a lot of issues like this so that a lot of their libraries um, degrade gracefully, where if you have JavaScript, it works perfectly. If you have an incomplete JavaScript implementation, it works well enough. And then if you don't have it, it still works. Um, and that's more than can be said for a lot of libraries out there. All right, so let's lay the foundation for one other example, and that's this one. So this was sort of a real world problem. When I was an undergraduate, we had uh, freshman intramural sports, and this wasn't all that long ago, but the mechanism of the day in 1995 was to fill out a form if you wanted to play sports, walk it halfway across Harvard Yard, slide it into the mailbox of like a, an RA on campus, and they would then you know, organize sports, and then they had, we had email, so they would then email people the results, but this was very low-hanging fruit. If ever there were an opportunity, even in 1995, to put something on the web, this was one of them. And so one of the first things I did was learn, frankly, a little dynamic programming. I knew HTML at the time and C, so this was as good an opportunity as any at the time to learn Perl. But with PHP, can we implement precisely the same thing? We wanted to present all of the freshmen on campus with a web page that looked a little something like this, where we asked their name, whether or not they want to be captain, what their gender is, and also what dorm they are in. And it's useful for discussion for the moment now because we have some fairly familiar input mechanisms. So I might want to type something like David here. Sure, I'll be captain, M, I lived in Matthews, and I want to be able to click register. But what we'll now have after a short break is an opportunity to parse more interesting data and maybe ask the user not for name, but an email address, which will open up an opportunity to actually validate data with regular expressions, which was another feature we promised. So why don't we change tapes and take a five minute break? All right, so just for the sake of closing one loop, uh, what I failed to recall is that there is a third argument to header, even though we've only seen one so far. It's the third argument called HTTP response code, where you can actually specify a numeric value that you want to accompany a particular header issuance. Um, and I'll point out one thing about the syntax of PHP.net, lest you be a little puzzled by some of it if new to this. So uh, functions have return values and parameters and such. So that's what we're seeing here. The header function returns nothing so its return type is void. And it takes, apparently, as many as three arguments, but not necessarily all of them. Most any time you see square brackets in documentation means that the following thing is optional. And sometimes it's optional conditional on the previous thing. That's what the nesting of square break, uh, brackets here means. So what this means is that you definitely have to pass in the first argument called string. And that's the quote unquote location, colon, HTTP, whatever. But you can also then say true or false as a second parameter, which says, if I already issued this same header, location colon, override it with this version of the header. Uh, so typically, you want to specify that as true. Um, although it's rare, frankly, I think that your own code would issue the same header twice. There's presumably some ways of fixing that logically. But because it says replace equals true, that means the default value of this argument is in fact true. It's implied. Then finally, it takes a third argument optionally, an int, uh, whereby you can specify the numeric code. So it's actually useful in this case to know what the default values, is, uh, values are of these arguments. Because for instance, if I want to send HTTP, if I want to send quote unquote location, colon, and some URL, but then send a 301, as this gentleman proposed, I can't just say that string, comma, 301, because the 301 would be conflated as the replace Vary the replace parameter, so I needed to actually insert a second parameter so that I can use the third, and so would I hard code presumably the value true as my second argument. So very common uh, approach to documentation in PHP.net. It's nothing to be sort of startled by, but just familiar.
with what it's actually conveying. All right, so we left off with this little setup here, registering for freshman intramural sports. So let's go ahead and see first what's underneath the hood of this thing. I can go ahead and look at the source code, for instance. Kept it pretty simple this time. It's just some basic uh, form syntax using a little invisible table for layout since it's simple. Uh, and notice the value of two things up here. The action line is apparently going to submit to a little sanity check. Register.php and the method I'm going to use is get. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe we're starting to reach the point where we should use post, but we'll see. Unfortunately, I don't yet have a file called register.php, so I need to do something with this. And back in the day, what I did was I just wrote student submissions out to a file, or maybe I frankly I don't remember, or I emailed the RA in charge because at least having a folder of emails was one step better than having a stack of paper. Yeah. Correct. I did not give the form element a name because I just don't need it in this case. The only reason I needed it before was because of uh, the JavaScripting. OK. So register.php. So unfortunately, if I go ahead and click Submit now after filling this out, it goes to register.php, but our website realizes, sorry, that file doesn't yet exist, 404. And as an aside, when you have some control over Apache, the web server, you can override some of the default boring behavior and actually have your own error messages like this. Frankly, perhaps a more clear website would omit the 404 mention altogether, because 99% of people have no clue what that means. Given that this is a course on website stuff, we figured we'd reveal the code. But we can override that um, just using some server-side config. So let's implement register.php. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Let's take the email approach. Because we can, and you'll see that it's relatively simple. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this. So register. Register has to take in a few things. So let's do the following. Here is my form. Um, let's do a little sanity check first. So again, last week I mentioned that a useful diagnostic tool is to do something like this. And again, this is not going to be well-formed XHTML yet, but pre-tag. Close pre for preformatted text, just because I'm curious. I want to see recursively what is inside of what super global. Yeah. All right, let's see what's inside of get. All right, so I'm going to save this. Again, this is not functional code. It's just sort of diagnostic. So let me click register now. OK, so this is what I am submitting, apparently. And it gives us some eyes inside of what's going on underneath the hood. Apparently, inside, apparently dollar sign underscore get is an array, associative array by nature of PHP. It's got four keys. Name, captain, gender, dorm, which just so happened to correspond to what, presumably? And you have the code anyway from this, froshims.html. Yeah, the inputs, the names I gave to the inputs. So those are the keys that end up in this super global. And the values are what I typed in or the results of what I checked. And the only curious one here is which. Which value did I not explicitly type? On. So on is apparent. Oh, and M I didn't type. I checked a radio button, but we'll see how that was done. So on is the you know, weird convention someone chose to send the notion that a checkbox was checked. It sends the value of on. Or really a non null value is what's useful there. So the M, as an aside, came from the fact that when I implemented my radio button, which is under gender, I had two mutually exclusive button choices, and they're mutually exclusive because I gave each of the radio buttons the same name. And you get that exclusivity, much like the submit buttons. You either have one or the other based on which one was clicked. Same deal here. OK, so let's go ahead now and do something with this data. Printing it out is not all that interesting. Let me go ahead and send an email. All right, so how do I do that? Well, you know, it's been a while. How do I uh, do that? Well, actually, we can use our own website finally. First time I've ever used it. All right, so let's search for the mail function on PHP. And one of the nice things about PHP is if you have it installed on a server that, needless to say, also has a mail server running or the capability of sending mail, uh, you have a couple of options. This is by far the most common, and it's relatively simple. There is a function called mail, returns true or false, whether or not it sent the mail, it takes a field called to, two fields, subject, message, and then optionally, some additional headers, some additional parameters, some stuff that we probably don't need to care about. So let me go ahead and just use the first three for now. All right, so two, subject, and message. Well, let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and first ditch this, then ditch this, and I'm going to say something like uh, two 
is going to be the ra at harvard.edu for that resident advisor, whatever address that is. Uh, subject equals frosh im's registration or whatever can go there. Now I need to construct the message. So I can do this in a few ways. Let's do it as explicitly as possible. Let me go ahead and say something like this. Message equals quote unquote, this person just registered colon, new line, new line, because this is an email. And again, there's an infinite number of ways we can do this. The goal is just to do sort of a warm up exercise here. So who just registered? So message concatenate with itself. So dot equals is concatenate to yourself or append to yourself. Uh, what do I want to put there first? Dollar sign. How about this? OK, now maybe dot, quote unquote, new line. Again, infinite number of ways to do this. And let me show one other approach as an aside. It depends on your penchant for cleanliness or style. I could also do this. I could put it all in quotes. But now I can't confuse the PHP parser. So if you ever nest a variable inside of a string, you can put it in curly braces like that without confusing the parser. And now I can get away with putting the new line at the end there. So this line and this one, these last two lines, are equivalent. Um, I'll leave it to you as to which one is preferable. I will say that in a lot of open source software, a lot of people do this. A lot of people also omit the spaces around the concatenation operator just because you see all different things from the course's perspective. Doesn't really matter, but be self-consistent. Do the same thing yourself consistently. Uh, let's go with this first version, if only because it's a little more explicit and clear today. All right, so after that, typos are bad. So I just created a new variable accidentally. So let me go ahead and concatenate now. What else? What came next? Uh, captain. You know, it's going to say on or nothing. Frankly, the RA can figure it out, what that means. We don't need to really clean things up today. So we'll cut some corners here. Uh, OK, after that, we had uh, what was it? gender. So I can just M or F is fine. They can assume what that means, uh, infer what that means. And then dorm, how about that? And then message equals about love the website. OK, so now I have in a variable called message, just a message I want to send to the user. And sort of testament to the power of PHP to, whoops, to subject message done. All right, so there is, frankly, this probably took me ten, like hours when I was a freshman uh, learning a language for the first time. But I mean, this gets the job done. By no means pretty. Frankly, we're kind of cutting a bad corner here because the user now is just going to hit a dead end, unfortunately. So you know, we could kind of have fun with the students. It would still log that they registered, but we could start to do DisneyWorld.com. So they get at least a response now. But hopefully, we can do something a little smarter. So realize, too that even though I'm in PHP mode, so to speak, right now, I can still drop out of this and do something like this, HTML. And I won't waste time on proper XHTML for the moment. But let me do a head here and then a title and say something like thanks. Uh, close title, close head, uh, close body. And then here I'm really going to cut corners and just say thanks, you're registered close body, that would get the job done too. Because the file uh, gets executed server side first. All that H uh, PHP code gets executed. A mail presumably gets sent, though I'm not being very rigorous here with my error checking, to be sure. And then eventually, I just tell the user on blind faith that they're registered. Now, I can do this a little more intelligently. I could do something like this. So uh, if mail, uh, let's say, equals equals true, then I can go ahead and do something optionally. So again, I'll just kind of tease right now with the approaches we can take here. But clearly, there's room for improvement. But for now, it just speaks to, one, how we get access to the data, which is at the end of the day the most important thing, perhaps. And two, just how relatively easily can we send that data off somewhere. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a database. Well. You could argue that the RA's inbox is now our database or taking the place thereof. But we'll be able, ultimately, to write to a file. We could write it to an XML file. More interestingly, in a couple of weeks, would we write the same data to a row in a database table, but relatively easily as well? Uh, yeah, and back. I was wondering if, you, if CHP requires the equal, equal true, like, wouldn't that, that, that mail thing of returns true or false, right? You need Good question. So PHP has this equal, equal, equal operator, which per last time checks not only the return value, uh, the value, emphasis there, and also the type. 
it checks. Um, in this case, because we checked the documentation and the mail function only returns true or false, doesn't matter. The problem arises in PHP when a function has a mixed return type. What that means is it could return an int, a string, true, or false. And unfortunately, you can't distinguish with equals equals 0 from false, or 1 from true, or 1. In this context, no. You do not need equals equals equals. No, do you need to say equal equals? Like, I would think in other languages, oh. in mail, like that would That is OK, too. Okay. And then you could do some stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, so I'm being a lit. Oh, at the end of the HTML block. Uh, So yes, so the way I would probably implement this code is more like this. So I'm going to put this code up top so that that definitely gets prepared when the user visits this page. One approach, and again, there's infinite numbers. And one of the things we'll do in sections, to be honest, week to week, is focus on a lot of these lower level implementation details, especially with regard to the project. But probably what I would do here is something like this, if mail to subject message, and then I have a couple of syntactic approaches. I can say colon, uh, close PHP mode. If it succeeds, so if implicitly true, say that to the user. Else, colon, sorry, problem, call RA. Really punting on our error handling there, but end if. So this is prob I'm kind of going through a phase where, frankly, I like syntax like this in PHP. And it's pretty clean. And it keeps it clear what the logic flow is later in the file. Just so you see other syntactic approaches, right here I've used this colon approach, where I have a colon there and a colon after the else, and then an explicit end if. Another approach is to use the more familiar curly braces, and for instance, to open the curly brace there, and then not use these colons, but rather close the curly brace there open it there, and then down here simply close, whoops, close the curly brace. You'll see that approach too. Um, but that's just another piece of syntactic uh, detail. Is there another question? Uh, no, because now I put it back inside of these brackets here. But frankly, I've gotten into this phase because I think this is a little clearer than just the fact that I'm taking care to balance all of my curly braces. But again, there's many other ways to do this. I could put all of that logic up top. And again, we'll look at this in section. And even if it's sort of too much E75 in one night to attend sections after lectures on Mondays, realize they are taped and put online afterward as well. Yeah? Uh, so there's a couple of modes that PHP can operate in with regard to mail. Um, the default is to, I believe, invoke like user local bin send mail, and it will just talk to the local host. You can also configure it to use SMTP, um, but only, I believe, on a Windows platform can you do that with PHP. Otherwise, you need a third-party library. Um, and v1, and I'll mention this as an aside, particularly with an eye toward final projects, you'll be a little overwhelmed by the websites here. But by far, the best PHP mail uh, library I've used, because one, it's simple. Two, it does everything like attachments and multiple recipients just so easily, is this thing here. So if you Google PHP mailer, one word, you'll get this. And if you navigate your way through this mess, you'll eventually get a free open source uh, mailing library that's truly cross-platform. You'll occasionally stumble across stupid inconsistencies on the Linux implementation of PHP and the Windows one. One of them does pertain to mail, which is why anytime I wrote code, frankly, I just whip out that library instead of PHP's built-in mail function. It's just more powerful, handles attachments, just very user-friendly. OK, other questions? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Ah, so it doesn't in this case. And this is one of the shortcomings. Right now, it's going to get sent as the user. Uh, probably, if I'm using, C it's going to probably come out as CS75 at CS75.net, because that's the user ID under which my code is executing. Or worst case, it'll say root. And that's what you need to use the additional headers arguments for. And this is where this function gets annoying. You have to then say from, colon. So this is, again, why I tend to use a library for mail. So very quick and dirty gets the job done, but. But, would this, but then that would, would that allow you to actually send mail with somebody else if you decided to? I mean, the reason, one of the reasons I'm asking, if 
you would have able to put the thumb in. Mm -hmm. You could say, I'm sending NATO, and I could be something totally different than who I really am. Yes, absolutely. Question is, doesn't that mean you could forge emails by changing the firm address? Yes, absolutely. But honestly, there's an infinite number of other ways anyone can do this. Um, it's not a. It, like, I could do it by typing a few commands into a server right now. I could spoof it with any number of email accounts. So, that actually, what you just described, is not hard at all. Um, PHP makes it possible, but so do any number of other tools. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you an email from uh, Dan later tonight if you want, <laughs> just to demonstrate. Or from yourself, better yet. <laughs> okay. OK, uh, so let's add one feature to this. Again, just some building blocks for, for now. But let's add a compelling one, which is, that of whoops, which is that of regular expressions. So regular expression is something is a feature of many, many languages. PHP essentially steals Perl's own syntax, which many people do. Um, and they're very powerful. They take some getting used to, but frankly, even though if you've never used these things before, tables like this might be a little overwhelming and you might kind of futz with things over time. You just get to know some of the basic syntax and frankly, there's so many damn manuals and tutorials out there, you can't help but pick up new tricks over time. We'll do something very simple now. We will add a field to the form that asks for the student's email address and we're just going to do a modicum of validation here so that the user can't just type in nonsense. We're at least going to check for like a username, an at sign, and then some stuff afterwards. But we could be really anal and really rigorously check for it, but we're not going to bother for now. Let's just at least uh, present some basics here. So let me go back to this. Uh, I'm going to go to froshims.html. Uh, copy paste will be my friend here. And I've now just integrated a, an email field by labeling it as such, changing the name to email. If I go back now to my form on my own website, I now have an email field. All right, so I'm going to type in mailin at post.harvard.edu. I'll be mail and captain and Matthews. So validation, as you presumably know, is just about checking if data is as it should be. And generally, the user is redirected back to the form if you don't like something they've done. Very common. It, we probably don't care if they're trying to forge their gender or their dorm or whatever. But email is kind of important because we need to reach the students. If their email address is wrong, that whole, defeats the whole purpose of registration. So let's at least do some form of error checking. So I'm going to go back to the server side here. I'm going to go into register.php. Let me go ahead and make a new version just so we don't clobber the work we've done. I'll leave these online later. So let me go in here. And I'm going to go ahead and ditch the email functionality and just focus on validation. Let me go ahead and do this. Um, let's go ahead and say infinite number of ways to do this. Uh, correct gets true. And now we're going to do a few sanity checks. So if, uh, let's see, dollar sign underscore get name. So what can we do here? So we could do something like this. If it equals equals nothing, for the user type no name, let's go ahead and set correct equal to false. Just some very basic tests for now. Uh, if uh, the email address is blank, let's also say it's false. Let's check if um, gender, nah, people can keep that private. We don't really care. Captain doesn't really matter. Dorm's really not that helpful. So let's just do two basic checks. At minimally, we need to know the kid's name and their email address if we're ever going to reach them again or call them by their name. OK, so this is very simple. But now I'm going to follow my same structure as before. I'm not going to bother mailing. I'm just going to do something like, uh, let's say, if correct. And then go ahead and say, thanks, you're registered. Else, sorry, problem, uh, go back and fix your form. OK, so this is never, never, never a good solution to just give the user no helpful hints. But again, we're just trying to demonstrate regular expressions. And we'll worry um, later about um, sort of cleaning this up or when we actually get to project one time. So we're at least acknowledging or capturing the problem if the user fails to provide any of those values. So let's go ahead and reload this page. Uh, let's go ahead and type in David. Eh, I don't need to give you my email address, but I'll say I want to be Captain Mail Matthews Register. Hmm. <laughs> What's that? Oh, thank you. OK. Oh, and we've also been emailing ra at harvard.edu this whole time. All right, that's OK. <laughs> we'll see if it bounces back to our server later. Yes, OK. So. Uh, user error, I had been submitting to the wrong form that time. So thank you. Let's fix that. OK, 
So now, let's go back, reload the form. Let's I make the same mistake twice. Little sanity check. Let me view the page source. Yep, good to go. So David, Captain, Mail, Matthews, register. OK, good. So sorry, problem, go back and fix your form. So it's really not hard, obviously, to check for a given value. But you know what? A difficult student can just do this. Hit the space bar, register. Apparently, that slipped them past. So there's a few things. And again, just some hints for tonight. So register two. So you know what might be a little smarter? Let's trim the whole variable. So the trim function, as the name implies, gets rid of white space. This too, incredibly useful, especially when you don't want bogus white space ending up in your database, which will become more important over time. So now, and I don't have to reload the client side, because I'm not changing froshams.html. Now I can hit spacebar all I want, because trim is going to reduce all that space to the empty string, and I can detect that now. But still not good enough, because uh, this is not an email address, and yet it's going to let me through now by typing in a string. So let's do a little bit of structural checking here by using a different function altogether. So I'm going to instead whip out a function called preg match, and preg match takes a couple of arguments. The first one is going to be a regular expression, the second one is a string that you're checking the value of. So what does this mean? Well, quote unquote, and then any regular expression for now goes inside of, by convention, slash slash. So that's just necessary syntax stolen from Perl. All right, and then what do I want to check of the regular expression that I'll write in a second against? I want to check it against the email field. So this setup here is meant to ask if the user's input matches the following. Actually, we need to invert it probably. So if the user's input does not match the following pattern, recognize that, they're, that correct is false. In other words, set that flag to false. So now we just need the regular expression. Well, I'm not very good with regular expressions yet, but I know how to type my own email address. So let's at least limit registration to me. All right, and just say, if get underscore, underscore get email equals this string, let the user throw. All right, so let's see if I've at least made some improvements here. So David, uh, Malin at post.harvard. Dot edu register. OK, seems to work. And now let's try changing it to like Dan. See if that works. OK, no, Dan is not allowed to register. Unfortunately, I haven't used some tricks from last week. If I say Malin and there's a Joe Malin at harvard.education, unfortunately, he's going to get through too. Why is that? So it still matches the string. So there was a syntactic detail from last week that explicitly told the parser, you better start matching from the start of the string and then stop at the end of the string, which we've omitted here. And what's the conventional notation for that? So caret at the front and dollar sign at the end. No idea why those two came into existence. They're not even symmetrical aesthetically. But that's the way it is. So now only mailing at post.harvard.edu is going to get through. But even that's a small white lie. Uh, the if block ends right after the semicolon. So, but if I have multiple sentences, multiple uh, there, then I would, you would need curly braces if you want to have multiple statements below a condition. So this is a small white line. Those with a background already in regular expressions might know that this doesn't just match mainlin at post.harvard.edu. Matches an infinite number. It actually matches, let's be really anal here, 65,536 other people. At. Not at, that's OK. Dot the dot. The dot is any character, which means I could plug in any ASCII character where either of these dots are. Now, some of them I can't type at the keyboard, so that was a slight mathematical exaggeration just to impress you with my arithmetic. But the dot signifies any character. So if I want a literal dot in the context of regular expressions, we need to escape the dots using the backslash notation. So again, basic building blocks, but ones that will be very recurrent anytime you're trying to do something like this. OK, so still not good enough. Like now I'm detecting only mailing it post and only letting him register, but he's the guy who wrote this. This is not the, the student body we want to allow through. So let's allow anyone dot star with a post.harvard.edu address. And you know what? Better than that, let's allow anyone with a dot start with a harvard.edu address, irrespective of their subdomain. Now, here too, those with some background in regular expressions might realize 
that I could still type in david at foo at bar at harvard.edu, and that would slip past. So I'm not constraining the structure here. I'm saying that you need at least one at sign between something and the harvard.edu, but I'm not very precisely specifying what an email address is. Um, for our purposes, though, do we really care about detecting the wise ass who puts like three at signs in his email address? I mean, do we really want them playing sports on our team? I mean, maybe not. So again, there's a trade off between how much time you're going to spend thinking through all of the possible variants a user might type in versus just raising the bar slightly to avoid stupid common typos and other such mistakes. So we've probably raised the bar sufficiently here by saying give me any username at any subdomain, if any at all, harvard.edu. So that's probably good enough, at least for our purposes. But um, to be honest, if I were writing, say, production code, I would probably look around for a library that someone else had written who had taken into account all of the formalities in the email RFC. Um, from years ago to really get the encoding of an email address right. But for something like this, certainly not necessary. And frankly, this I still understand. So you will very quickly start to see regular expressions that even you don't understand if they're that complex. So that's not necessarily a good thing either. Yeah? Um, I probably would have written star at star. You do. So um, star has been used in different ways over the years in different contexts. In a regular expression, star means zero or more of the preceding. You need the preceding, and dot signifies any character. Now, technically, and I'll offer this not for the sake of confusion, but just to fix a couple of things, clearly in an email address, dot is too powerful, because we don't want at signs to the left of the at sign. So you can have what are called character classes, which are things in square brackets, and you can invert them with yet another caret symbol, which unfortunately in this context has other meaning. And I could say this, so bracket, caret, at bracket means any character other than the at sign zero or more times. And actually, that too is invalid. I can't have an empty e username. I really need plus, which is not zero or more, but one or more. So again, there's these iterative refinements. And to be honest, even when I'm writing code today, whether it's for an email address or other fields, I generally start simple, and then I start tweaking it, kind of ratcheting things up when I want to protect against other possible inputs. And that's exactly what we're doing here. What's that? So A through Z. So you can also have uh, ranges, A through Z, capital A through Z, 0 through 9. Uh, I can allow uh, hyphens itself, uh, underscores, dots itself. So there's a bunch of characters valid in email addresses. But again, it's a trade-off. Readability, do you care? But you do have this power. I will say, please don't ever implement a website that does this. Let's say, uh, um, let me write this how some foolish developer probably wrote it elsewhere. Let's say this dot, uh, let's say dot word. OK, so here's one. And let me simplify the left-hand side just to avoid distractions. So dot plus there. So I have seen this way too many times. And it frankly pisses me off every time. So. <laughs> All right, minor rant, but useful educationally. So this here, backslash w, says any word character. So it's not white space. Backslash s is white space. Backslash w is word character. This has precise meaning in the manual, but essentially it boils down to like a through z, and capital A through z, word characters, and maybe numbers also. I forget offhand. Um, I just needed a placeholder there. Then that means explicit dot, and then backslash w is again, and then curly braces three. What might that mean? So a TLD with a three uh, letter TLD. But clearly, there are country codes out there. So I can do two comma three. And this means minimum two, maximum three. Uh, but then what, well, there's info now, dot info. Not that that's a classy address just yet. But OK, so we need some discretion there. But the omission here is that there are some really annoying people out there who don't know about subdomains. And don't let people like mailin at post.harvard.edu or mailin at fast.harvard.edu or you at any subdomain.something.com register for their website because they don't allow a period to the left of the TLD. And what this is literally meant in real world, and these are real commercial websites that have done this, I have to use like my MIT address or my Gmail address or anything other than my Harvard address because they don't know that subdomains exist. Um, 
OK, I guess I should calm down. But this, is, this ultimately boils down, honestly, to just a stupid omission in a regular expression or just complete lack of awareness of the various structures that, of formats that email addresses take. So realize that you can do harm as well as some good with these. So at the end of the day, the exercise here was just to have some form of error checking Problem set one will expect uh, yet more so that the user is not uh, making uh, uh, relatively easy attempts to break your own implementation of an e-commerce site. All right, so with that said, um, some building blocks that will work us toward next week and also project one. So one of PHP's most compelling capabilities is just the ease with which you can implement what are called sessions or shopping carts is a more specific incarnation of that. Um, but PHP, before we get there, does support a few features of languages that you might be familiar with from other languages, like object orientation. So you have the notion of classes and objects in PHP. We in the course don't dwell on it too much for a couple of reasons, one of which a lot of students coming into the course just haven't a solid OOP background. And it's just not prerequisite for doing interesting, good things with PHP or server-side code. But those of you with more uh, rigorous backgrounds in object-oriented programming and inheritance and all of these fancy features can use those same features within PHP. Just realize the course itself doesn't emphasize them particularly. I offer this now for consideration because those of you who might be coming into the course more advanced might realize that for project one, when you want to implement a shopping cart, even though we'll see in a moment we can use this super global called session to store anything we want in the server's memory, a la shopping cart features, um, you might find it useful to write a class, make objects out of it called items or food or something, and encapsulate multiple pieces of data at once. So just realize that functionality is there. If you'd like to scratch that surface, a little uh, introduction to it is there. But more on that in sections or future examples. Uh, so this was the best image I could come up with to depict a cookie. Makes them seem more fun. What is a cookie? We talked briefly about this already. What's a cookie in the context of web browsers? <laughs> Information store? Any, I'll take anyone. Yeah, so it's temporary data stored where? Good, so stored on the client side, but sent back and forth and back and forth to the server to remind the server what data it stored on the client side. So we saw this. Uh, we saw this last week by way of the uh, set, a week or so ago, uh, by way of the set cookie header and the cookie header, which were used by server and client respectively to actually exchange some data. So cookies allow you to store somewhat arbitrary information inside the browser's RAM or in the browser or the user's hard drive. So you, have, you the programmer, have some discretion if the cookie is quote unquote persistent or ephemeral. Does it live for only the life of the browser window and once it's closed, bye bye? Or does it stick around? The course's website uses persistent cookies to remember that you've logged into the website if you check that button. Right? The whole point of that button is so that when you quit your browser, shut down for the night, we still know that you've been logged in by way of remembering, your, um, remembering the fact that you've been logged in. So you can do some very stupid things with cookies too. The simplest way to implement uh, recollection that the user is logged in is just store their username and password in a cookie on their computer because we saw last week that the, the client the browser will just resend username and password in that cookie again and again. And that's so nice because you, the server, can then just grab the username, grab the password, do a quick check server side. If it's legit, the user is logged in. But there's some hopefully obvious downsides of this, among which are, OK, OK, so security, but be more specific. Can't just say security and assume we know. OK, so you use the same username and password for a site. And, but why is that bad fundamentally here? So anyone can use it under what circumstances? Be even more specific. OK, so by taking the cookie. So if you're on a lab computer, that's bad news, right? Because anyone can walk over and see it. Even if it's just your own personal computer, but your screensaver doesn't lock, you step up. It's just your cookies are stored in the clear. They're not encrypted by default. And so really, someone who's just nosy can start looking around Firefox, Safari, whatever, and see your cookies, and thus these values. 
And ultimately, it's just not necessary. There are more intelligent ways, some of which we'll discuss、um, next time, in fact, how you can store information about the user, but not store it by remembering what's otherwise private information. Rather, you can leverage some mathematics, some probability, and do what we do in the course's website is we plant on your computer essentially a really big random number that we've stored server side. Now, granted, if someone sat down at your computer and stole that really big random number, they could impersonate you. By copying that really big number to their own computer. But this is a fundamental weakness of session support in general. And cookies in general, the internet, sort of not a course website failing per se.、Um, it's just an, a risk that you take by checking that box. And that's why a lot of sites force you to opt in by checking the box. It's not default behavior. But what we don't do is store your password on your, in your browser. We do store your username. Um, really, as a convenience so that we pre populate the form. But we made the design decision that、eh, that's really not as big a deal because if you click explicitly log out, we also delete that cookie anyway. So, again, just a design trade off. But how is this implemented? And that's the, the look we'll have now because it will let us do some very interesting things. So, PHP gives you dollar sign underscore session. Which is another super global. It doesn't have to do with data that's come from the browser, like get and request and post, but rather session is a bucket that you can put anything you want about the current user, and you can just trust on blind faith that the next time that same user visits your site, that is, hits one of your PHP files, PHP and Apache together will hand you the same dollar sign underscore session that you used with this user the last time. So, it's sort of magical and it's wonderfully useful. How does it work? Well, using some of these basic building blocks. When you use PHP, if you include at the top of your file a line called session underscore start at the very top of your file, you can technically put it other places, but bad things happen if you, don't, if you do. So, at the very top of your file, if the first thing you call in every one of your PHP files is session start, what PHP does is it sends along with all of your other content. A header called set cookie. And we've seen that. And the name of the cookie it sets by default is, anyone know? Because I think we saw it actually. It sends by default, though you can change this in php.ini, php ses id. So it sends a cookie with this name whose value is a really big random number. So that's actually just what the course website does. We essentially stole our implementation from what PHP fundamentally does for sessions. So, what does this mean? Well, PHP sends a cookie to your computer called this with a really big random number. Probabilistically, it's not going to give that random number to anyone else, though, very slight probability that it might, but there are ways to avoid that. And what this means is your browser, by definition of HTTP and cookie support, will remind the server of this really big random number and the name of this cookie every request you make to that website. So it's like you're sort of very subtly reminding the server hey, not this is David, but hey, this is 123456. Hey, this is 123456. Now, PHP, meanwhile, has its own database on the server side that maps this really large number to a file. Containing the contents of dollar sign underscore session. So if you think of session essentially being a shopping cart, PHP stores on the server a little database that represents every user's shopping cart. Now it doesn't have to be a shopping cart, but it's a chunk of memory that's devoted to that user. And it does this by default by way of a very familiar directory. If I go to slash temp and ls, What you'll see in this directory, and technically, if we were streaming live, this means anyone on the internet could start stealing all these people's sessions by copying down what are the really big random numbers I described, but I'll delete them、uh, in just a moment, and it will take hours for this to go up anyway. But inside of every one of those files are little pieces of information that our website, or frankly, some of the students in this room, if you really got industrious and maybe don't belong so much in the course just yet, since we're still on week two, have been putting in visitors' sessions. So, this is just a text file. What PHP can do is serialize objects, much like Java can in other languages, which means they take a RAM based representation of an object and somehow store it as a string, put it in a file. So, what's happening really is every time a user visits foo.php, and foo.php has session、uh, underscore start at the top, PHP uses that as a queue to check if the user's browser just sent a cookie called this. If so, it grabs that number. If it finds a number, it then checks slash temp for a file called sess underscore really big number. If it finds it, it opens up the file, reads the contents from disk into RAM, and hands you, the coder, 
dollar sign underscore session containing the contents of that file. Now for scalability, there's other places you can put these files. You can put them in an actual database. You can put them on shared storage so you can have multiple web servers. More on that when we discuss scalability. But that's how the illusion of state is maintained between server and uh, browser. And it boils down to you, the programmer, just having to call this function. And in that sense, it is magical because so much of this goes on underneath the hood. So anytime you need to retain information, so I'm going to go ahead and remove all these sesh files. Now, there is a downside here. When I hit enter in a moment, what's going to happen? That's right. So anyone who's not in class right now and is trying to use the course's website, it's not going to break on them per se, but now, whoops, I am not uh, roots. Uh, okay. Okay, now I'm going to do rmf temp sesh. Anyone who's logged into the course's website or the bulletin board right now is no longer. But not a big deal, they can re-log in. Because we've essentially just forgotten who they are. So not such a big deal, but, and this will be a juicy conversation come security time, um, you can do bad things just by knowing what these really big random numbers are. And, and I'll tease you by saying if you go to Starbucks often or any place that, like that that has internet access and you're not using any kind of encryption, you're just using the local access point, checking your mail, um, and you're using Facebook, for instance. Now, sites like Facebook do uh, encrypt your username and password when you log into the site, but for performance and cost reasons thereafter, most, uh, almost no page on Facebook is actually encrypted. So obviously someone could sniff your traffic and see what photos you're looking at or who you're poking or all of this, right? That's sort of basic TCP IP stuff. If unfamiliar, okay, FYI, you, people can do that. But a little more scary, thanks to sessions and in turn cookies and in turn languages like PHP, if what I sniff is not just your pokes and your messages and your photos, but also the more esoteric cookies going across the wire, I, being this um, adversary sitting next to you or across the room in Starbucks, could take your session ID, which I can sniff very easily, tell my browser to start claiming that that's my PHP sesh ID, and I can effectively log into your Facebook account just by nature of the way cookies and sessions work because this is called session hijacking, and it's really not that hard. Now, there are ways to avoid this. Thankfully, we have SSL, but again, for reasons of cost, many websites don't do this. So realize, too, there's a, if there's a reason to stick, in, stick with the course till the end, we'll tease apart some of these sociological problems and social problems, but also the underlying technical reasons for them. So if we tease with the bad stuff, can we tease with the good stuff? So yes, there's ways of implementing authentication. And one of the stories we'll tell next week is how we could implement, for instance, the username and password login on the courses website. And this will be useful because for your own project too, CS75 Finance, will you perhaps needless to say, want to authenticate users if they're actually going to be able to quote unquote buy and sell stocks and manage portfolios. So it's a technique that you can borrow yourself. We'll also be able to restrict or rather ensure that certain URLs are always SSL protected. And we do this on the course's website for a few things. The grades page, which will eventually become useful. The bulletin board, just because we figure you know, we, might as, we, we can certainly handle the load and there's no reason that we need to disclose to the world or random strangers in Starbucks what personal questions you might be asking on the bulletin board or the dumb questions you might worry about disclosing. So we password protect that. And we also password protect, most importantly, the login page, where you actually type in your username and password. And we could do this in PHP. But again, just to hint at some of the power of rewrite rules and your actual web server and understanding the layer on top of which your own stuff is running, this is another snippet of an HT access file. The top line says, turn on the rewrite engine, just generally useful. And honestly, a very common mistake. If you're ever wondering why your rewrite rules don't work, Honestly, make sure you've turned on the engine explicitly. Um, what's this first one do? It says, if the HTTP host is not equal to www.cs75.net, go ahead and make it so. So that's sort of a revisit from last week. But more interesting is this down here. If the request URI, so if the URL, essentially, starts with slash login slash, OK, that is a sensitive resource. Let's protect that. Because if the URL starts with slash login and this variable called HTTPS is not equal to on, what do I want to do according to the third and last line here? Redirect the user to the HTTPS version of the page 
so that they're not even allowed to type in their password and other sensitive information until they're at that destination. And once they're redirected, this variable, apparently called HTTPS in all caps, will become on so that condition the next time they're, they hit their server will not actually apply. And that's how we maintain um, protections against certain pages without having to even do it in PHP code. We can protect ourselves from ourselves and not have to trust that we're going to remember in our PHP code to actually set up SSL because we can do it at this lower level. And frankly, even a system administrator could do it at the server configuration level if you really want to protect uh, certain resources. Um, so unfortunately, SSL certificates are a bit of a headache to set up on most servers. The world has not really made it easy to uh, well, they've made it relatively easy to buy certificates. They haven't made it very easy to use the certificates, um, though it does depend on the service. The best sort of web host out there in spirit is one that just tells you to buy the certificate, paste it. It's just a big text file generally. Paste it here, and they take care of all of the configuration details. But on a real server, there's a few lines you need to configure. And it's not hard per se, but it's one of these things that's not a terribly interesting problem to solve, and it varies based on servers. But in an Apache context, when you go out and buy a SSL certificate, which is generally going to cost between $30 and $300, depending on, frankly, what marketing hype you buy into, um, you will then get emailed or you will download securely one or more text files, which just represent secret keys that someone like VeriSign has said, we trust this person, David Malin, and his website. You then upload them to a server. You change a few config lines in like httpd.conf. So this stuff specifically. Um, but here, too, it's not a, often a terribly fun problem to solve. And as an aside, uh, without things devolving into another sort of uh, rant, if you will, it's kind of a scam, the whole industry. The fact that you have to pay for these things. And yes, in theory, cryptographically, you get certain protections by having someone like VeriSign say, we sold this certificate to someone. But there's so many damn websites out there, so many users. Um, SSL is a good thing. And mathematically, cryptographically, it's a good thing. But the fact that you have to pay for this whole infrastructure to work is an unfortunate reality. And I'll offer for your consideration, you, it is general for most websites that many people in this room might make, Paying $29 to GoDaddy is probably perfectly acceptable. And it's not necessary to pay like $300 to someone like VeriSign just so that you get their stamp of approval or other um, icing on the cake. And I think we mentioned already, or we will certainly see, some browsers are trying to give their industry more credibility by Firefox, for instance. If you get a the certain type of SSL cert and pay for it, you get a little green coloration of your URL when a user visits the site. And maybe that has value. And maybe to an important big company, $300 is sort of a no-brainer that you get this just to uh, avoid the really paranoid user from leaving your site altogether. But realize just to get basic protections up and running, $30 gets the job done really well. Um, so where are we going with this? Well, what you will be handed in a week's time is not only the spec for Project One, but an actual pizzeria's menu with subs and salads and pizzas as promised. And the goal will be to, one, come up with a data model, so to speak, a database representation of most of that data. It will not devolve into a tedious exercise of implementing a whole menu. We'll say, give us a few from this category, a few from this category, just to communicate the idea. We don't care if you do the all possible toppings on the menu. Um, then represent that with this language or uh, meta language called XML. More on that next week. Your website will have to allow users to browse this menu. You'll have to allow them to add stuff to their shopping cart, maybe some toppings or special instructions, click Submit to check out, and then ultimately they'll be emailed a little receipt indicating that their order has been placed. And what you'll find is that the, mo the setup for this problem is as follows. Sometimes an actual database, whether it's MySQL, Microsoft Access, or anything else, is an unnecessarily heavy-handed solution to a problem. I mean, back in the day, the Frosh IM's website certainly didn't need a full-fledged database, and I had no clue how to set it up anyway. And frankly, what we posit in the spec for this project is that the local pizzeria, you know, that they're not interested, they're maybe not technically savvy to want to manage a database. They're much more comfortable using notepad.exe or their favorite simple text editor. So you, the designer, might very well make a reasonable design decision that you're going to empower this, this user base to edit their own database with the simplest off-the-shelf text editing tool. And that's where we'll introduce XML in what I think is a fairly uh, relevant context. And we'll use it later in the semester for yet other fancy client-side uses. Uh, so with that said, a few minutes break. Then we'll have section across the way. Otherwise, we will see you next week.